We read in the sacred Bible and ecclesiastical history that sometimes God uses beasts in extraordinary ways to defend and benefit his servants. As the prophet Elisha was taunted by a brigade of irreligious and insolent youths, behold, two bears descended out of a nearby forest and wrought havoc among them. For 70 years, a desert raven brought food daily to St. Paul the Hermit, the first founder of solitary life. St. Anthony needed to bury the corpse of a desert dweller, but lacked the tools to dig his grave. Whereupon two lions appeared, dug it with their paws to the correct size, and departed like meek lambs after the saint blessed them. When St. John Bosco was in severe danger, divine providence deigned to provide him with a singular bodyguard, a large and beautiful gray dog that has been and will be the subject of many rumors and suppositions. There were several young men who saw him, petted him, and learned memorable details about his saga. In this episode, we recount some of the best stories from their reports. You're watching The Miracles and Prophecies of St. John Bosco, a project of America Needs Fatima. I'm your host, Matthew Miller. The gray dog resembled a flock dog or guard hound by its size and shape. No one, not even Don Bosco, ever knew where it came from or its owner. But while we do not know his pedigree, we can give him an award for serving Don Bosco and therefore the oratory for many years, a priceless advantage. Malevolent people continually threatened Don Bosco and his friends begged him to be on his guard so he was careful not to go out at nighttime. However, sometimes he had to stay in the city until late in the evening to be with a sick person, hold a meeting with someone on behalf of his pupils, or help a family deceived by heretics he felt might respond well to sound advice. Having fulfilled his duty, forgetful of self, he set out to Valdoco, a sparsely inhabited region at that time. The last building before the oratory was an asylum. All the rest was barren and uneven ground cluttered with bushes, dark spots that served as hiding places for evildoers. That stretch of road was very dangerous for Don Bosco, a target of the enemies of religion who fought him with every means they could. Late one evening in 1852, coming home alone and fearing some bad encounter, he saw a large dog standing beside him. At first he was afraid of it, but seeing that it was not threatening, but rather friendly, he quickly got on good terms with it. The faithful beast accompanied him to the oratory and left without entering. After that, every evening Don Bosco couldn't get home on time or lacked company, the gray dog would pop up on the side of the street as soon as Don Bosco passed the city's last buildings. Sometimes Don Bosco's mother, Margarita, would be worried that her son had not arrived home on time and would send a young man to go find the saint. Almost every time he was found walking together with his four-legged bodyguard. Carlo Tomatis assured us he met Grigio, the gray one, on the street around 9 p.m. He described it thus. He was a dog of a truly formidable appearance. When Mother Margaret saw him, she would repeatedly exclaim, Oh, the ugly beast. He looked almost like a wolf, with an elongated muzzle, straight ears, gray fur, and was one meter tall. He instilled fear in those who didn't know him. Grigio, whom Father Michael Rua saw twice, made prodigious appearances on key occasions to defend Don Bosco in moments of great danger. One evening, having forgotten something in town during the day, he was obliged to go out late. Mother Margaret tried to dissuade him, but he told her not to fear, grabbed his hat, called some young men to keep him company, and went to the gate. There he found Grigio lying down. The gatekeeper, who did not know the dog, tried several times to push him away with beatings, but he always returned as if waiting for someone. Ah, Grigio, Don Bosco exclaimed. So much the better, one more companion to join us. Get up and come along. However, instead of obeying, Grigio merely grunted and stayed put. 
Twice Don Bosco tried to pass, and twice Grigio refused to let him. Some young men poked it with their feet to try to make it move, but it responded with a frightful howl. Don Bosco then tried to go through the gate, but Grigio stood firmly in the way. Mother Margaret promptly said, if you don't want to listen to me, at least listen to the dog and don't go out. Seeing his mother so distressed, Don Bosco figured he might as well fulfill her wish and went back into the house. Less than a quarter of an hour later, a neighbor advised him to be on his guard because he had heard that three or four individuals were prowling around Valdoco, determined to kill him. Come on, boy. Don Bosco escaped many ambushes, but the villains never gave up their evil intentions. One night, past the halfway point on his way home, Don Bosco heard someone running after him. He turned around and saw a few steps away a fellow with a large club in his hand. He ran, hoping to reach the oratory before the individual caught up with him. Having reached the downhill slope, he saw at the bottom many other men running to catch him. Realizing the danger, he figured he had to free himself from the fellow behind him. As the latter was just about to catch up and strike, Don Bosco suddenly stopped and sank his elbow into the man's stomach with such agility and strength that the wretch fell to the ground. Ouch! I'm dead! He screamed. The others were about to surround Don Bosco holding sticks, but at that moment, Grigio providentially jumped next to him and growled so furiously that the terrified attackers thought they would be torn to bits. They begged Don Bosco to hold him back. Then, one after another, they all left, and Don Bosco was free to go. Grigio accompanied Don Bosco to the oratory, where, after crossing the courtyard to the kitchen door, he received many well-deserved caresses from Mama Margaret. Another night, when the saint was yet again late returning home to the oratory, an individual was lying in ambush behind a tree. He fired two shots at him at almost point-blank range. Miraculously, both of them missed. The assailant then ran down to try to finish off Don Bosco in another way. But right at that moment, Grigio appeared, snarling so ferociously that it sent the wretch flying and running for the hills. Then Grigio escorted his master home. Grigio, or my Fido, as Don Bosco would sometimes call him, has been the subject of much investigation and discussion. There's something mysterious and supernatural about him. No one could ever know where he went after accomplishing his mission. Don Bosco used to say, from time to time, I thought of trying to find the origin of that dog and its owner, but then said to myself, oh well, never mind whose it was, as long as it's my good friend. All I know is that animal was truly providential to me in the many dangers I found myself in. Some may see this account as just a fairy tale. Everyone can judge it as he wishes, but we deem it lawful to believe that in his paternal goodness, God used an animal which is a symbol of fidelity to defend and comfort Don Bosco. He defied the enemy's wrath and exposed himself to severe dangers to keep himself, his young men, and his neighbors faithful to God and the church. Thank you for watching, and if you'd like to hear the story of a vision Don Bosco had about satanic cats who hindered his students from making a good confession, please click on the video above me here. Godspeed. Come on, boy. Let's go.